Praise God. Well, it's a great joy for me to be here tonight and just to be with you folk. I do. I, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ most of all that what he's done in my life, that he has given me a story. And I believe it tells people that there's no such thing as a hopeless case. If that were true, if that were really true, then you're looking at one, a hopeless case. And I really do thank God we get an opportunity just to share. You know, I said today, you know, some of the best brains in England is trying to find a solution to bring the North and the South and the Protestant and the Catholic together. And yet today we could stand before people and say, we know a solution that works. That's because Jesus Christ is Lord. And we are reconciled not only with God, but with our fellow man. Because God changes the heart. It's not a united kingdom or a united Ireland, but it's God's kingdom. That's what it comes down to. God's kingdom. If you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you haven't your Bible with you, shame on you. <laughs> I'm reading from the King James Version. That's the one St. Paul used. <clears throat> it's true, you know, he translated this into Greek. <laughs> I see some people use the NIV, the Northern Ireland Version. That's quite good too. <laughs> but I like the King James. That's the one that I read in jail. And it's, if I memorize scripture... It's always from the King James. But I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. And this is what Paul the Apostle writes. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, or idolaters, or adulterers, or effeminate, or abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I like what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. I thought he must be writing a letter to Teen Challenge. I thought it wasn't David Wilkerson started Teen Challenge. It must have been Paul the Apostle. So I flicked back to the beginning to see where this Teen Challenge rehab was. I got the shock of my life. You'll not believe us, people. It was a church. Honestly. The church wasn't always snobs, you know. There was some real bad eggs in it. He says, such were some of you. But he says, now you're different. He says, it's safe to have an offering. He says, such were some of you. You used to be like that. But he says, now with the Spirit of God, and that's what brings change, you know, the Spirit of God. Not you trying to do it yourself. You know, you'll fall every time. But when you let go and let God, it's just like they were singing, there's no falling down. Because with the power of God within you, you are able. You are able. You know, I want to share tonight with you my testimony. You'd never guess from my accent where I'm from. That's right, Manchester. <laughs> but I grew up in Belfast, and I was 13 years old when the troubles began there. And I honestly didn't understand. I don't think I still understand what it was all over. But I remember the day it affected my life. I was coming home from school, and I was walking along the river, and I met these gang of boys who were all Roman Catholics. And one of them said to the others, I think we should beat David Hamilton up and throw him into the river. Now that's bad. For I'm David Hamilton. <laughs> it's really bad because I can't swim. And I says, excuse me, is there no other games we could play? <laughs> it says, no, you're going into the river. And I says, what for? And one of them says, because you are a Protestant and we are Catholics. And Protestant and Catholics fight with each other. I said, if you had asked me nicely, I'd have become a Catholic. <laughs> this was after I was claiming out of water, half soaked, and after being kicked and battered around the place. And I made a decision that day. Well, really, two decisions. One, learn to swim. And two, don't play with Catholics. <laughs> and that was a turning point for me, honestly. And... 
You know, every day coming home from school, there was the possibility of being beaten up, and it was safer to be in a gang. And so I joined this skinhead gang called the Rothkull Kai. Rothkull is the area I come from in Belfast, and the word Kai, you know, was the name of our gang, and the letters K-A-I stand for Kill All Irish Men, because we were Ulster men, and Catholics are Irish, but Protestants are British. And I did not like for anyone to call me an Irishman. Sometimes I'd hit them with the hammer just to help them remember <laughs> that I wasn't Irish. And at that time, being involved in the gang, we went around and threw petrol bombs into the homes of Roman Catholics and burned them out. And many Protestants were burned out of their homes. And they all moved into our area. And this was happening all over Belfast. And uh, eventually, areas either became all Protestant or all Catholic. And so my area, Rothkull, became all Protestant. And sadly, today, it is the biggest Protestant ghetto area in Northern Ireland. It has a population of 17,000. There wouldn't be five Roman Catholics living there. If there are, they haven't caught them yet. I mean, everything is painted red, white, and blue. The footpaths, the lampposts, the curbs. If your cat sits too long, they'll paint that red, white, and blue. That's just the kind of place that it is. And I grew up there, and as the troubles was going on, it was just every day you heard of bombings and shootings and killings, and I thought, this is no good. You know, we should be fighting the IRA. And I really felt sorry for the security forces. I thought, their hands are tied, and so we should do the fighting ourselves. And because I was involved in the street gang and, and street violence, you know, violence was a big part of my life, and I have actually hundreds of stitches on my arms you know, where I've been stabbed and fighting and different things. And so it didn't take much for me to decide to become a terrorist. And I, I decided to join one of the Protestant paramilitary groups. I was 17 at the time when I joined the UDA. And I remember at that time they gave me an army uniform and a gun. I thought I was Rambo running about the place. You know, happy days. And... You know, at that age, you really you, you think this is a good cause. You're a loyalist. You're fighting for your country. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And I really did believe in it. And so I got involved. And I remember at that time, my mother had suspicions that I was involved. She was uh, cleaning my bedroom one time, and she found a gun. And I denied. I said, it's not mine. You know, it belongs to my sister. <laughs> but she denied it. She was seven at the time. So my mother believed her and knew it belonged to me. And I was arrested not long after that. I went into prison for the first time. And at that time, I spent eight months in prison. Came out of prison again, got back involved that weekend again. And I really, you know, I just thought all of my friends are involved. I was one of the boys. And so I got back involved again. I started to do armed robberies and steal cars for other men to use and transport weapons around the city and different things. And I was getting deeper and deeper involved. I was arrested again for suspicion of armed robbery, bank robberies and things. Went back into prison again. Got a five-year sentence at this time. I remember it was at the end of this sentence. Well, I should tell you this first. It was Long Cash I was in. At that time, it's, it's now called the Mays Prison. But Long Cash, we have political status in prison. And that meant we were political prisoners. You didn't have to wear a prison uniform or eat prison food. That's a real blessing, you know. I'm not joking. You won't see that prison food. You know, to you see your tea, you could carry your cup upstairs this way or that way. <laughs> didn't matter. Your tea stayed. I never took sugar in my tea because if you tried to stir it, you couldn't get your spoon back out again. Honestly. And every Friday we get fish. Well, well, that's what they call them, fish. They were that size. These fish weren't caught. I think they committed suicide. You know, they didn't want to live any longer. And then people say you get good food in jail. We get a boiled egg every Tuesday for your breakfast. I never ate it. I put it in my pocket and then brought it back to my cell. When you took the shell off, you could play ping pong eat with each other. You know, so if they tell you you get good food in jail, don't you believe it? But we were allowed food parcels in, at that time. But one of the problems of, of then was because we were political prisoners, this is true, it's hard to believe, 
But we had bomb-making classes every morning. And then after tea break, you did weapon training. And I learned more in jail about terrorism than I did outside. And I thought, just wait till I get out. This will be good. And honestly, it was the end of my sentence, right? And I was sitting on my bed and I thought, this time next week I'll be out of jail. What am I going to do? And the first thing that came into my mind was, are you still going to be involved? And I said, why not? I'm a loyalist. I've all these tattoos on my arm. No surrender for God in Ulster. Remember 1690 and everything. And I thought, no, I believe in this. This is a good cause. And I thought, well, if you're still going to be a terrorist, you might as well be a good terrorist. And I thought, the most feared group in Northern Ireland in the paramilitary scene is the UVF. They're very militant and they're very secretive. And you can't just join this group. You must be invited by them to be a member. And so I told some guys in prison, I want to join the UVF. And they put the word around. And I wasn't home from prison that long when these men came to my home and asked me, was it true I wanted to join? And I said, yes, I do. They said, think it over, and we'll come back in a week's time. But once you join, you cannot leave. You're in for life. And I said, that's okay. I want to join. A week later, I went with these men, and they took me to a bar in Belfast and brought me upstairs into a room. And there was three men sitting behind the table, and they had a Ulster flag over the table. And there was something else sitting on the table, and I am sure this will surprise you. Because you know what it was? One of these, a Bible. And the guy in the middle said to me, do you believe in the Protestant cause? And I said, I do. He says, are you prepared to die for the Protestant cause? And I says, I am. He says, are you prepared to kill for the Protestant cause? And I says, I am. He says, put your hand on the Bible and raise your other hand and swear this oath. And that's what I done. I put my hand on the Bible and swore this oath and I give my heart and soul to the UVF. And I remember not long after that, my wife, you know, I would leave the back door open and some nights men would come into my home and they would lift up the floorboards and hide weapons or burn clothes in the fire. And many of the time my wife would say to me, David, who are those men downstairs? And I'd say, never mind, just stay in the bedroom, don't come down. And she knew that I was involved in terrorism. I had tried to deny it to her, you know, that, that I wasn't involved, but she found out early on in her marriage. She used to go shopping, you know, every Friday night with her mother, the dragon, and they'd be away for a couple of hours, you know. And uh, one night they came home early, and there were six of us sitting in my kitchen doing weapon training, and the back door opened, and here in the two of them walked, and they stopped and they looked at the table. We had a machine gun on the table. And I says, don't be worrying, it's only a hoover. You're all right. <laughs> but the dragon knew rightly it wasn't a hoover. There was no plug on it. <laughs> and she knew I was involved up to here on it. And I was arrested shortly after that. Maybe the dragon rang the place. I don't know. I'm only joking. But I went into prison anyway not long after. I was arrested when the army and the police raided my home. And I'd been involved in everything you can think of. At some stage or other, you do it as you work your way up through the ranks. And when I was arrested, I was an area commander in Belfast, in the area where I lived. That meant I was responsible for a team of men, for anything that happened in my area, for where weapons and things were kept. And I knew when I was arrested, one of my men was caught an attempted murder, and he turned uh, super grass, and he became an informer. So he named everybody else in the team, and we were all arrested. And one night, when the army and the police raided all of our homes, and so it was obvious to, to, to know who had turned traitor when 14 of us was in, and there was only one guy missing, you know. And so we all went back into jail again. We spent nine months winning trial, and. When I went for my trial, I had a list of charges, and I, I knew if I was found guilty, I was serving a life sentence. And so as I stood before the judge in the dock, he read out all of these charges, and I was found guilty for some and not guilty for others. But in the end, he gave me a total of 48 years, 
And he said to me, I would spend 12 to 15 years in prison. And I stood there. I looked back at this and I laughed. I had my UVF uniform on. And then I'm saying to the judge, I'm not guilty, Your Honor. You have to remember now I'm married. He sentenced me and I shouts, No surrender. And he looked at me and shook his head. My mother was shaking her head too. The judge thought I was nuts. My mother knew I was nuts. And they handcuffed me and brought me down into the cells. And then afterwards, I'm getting a visit with my mother and my young wife, and they're crying their eyes out, and I'm going, 12 years, <laughs> not belong a dragon in. You know, it's okay and all. I'm thinking, I'll never see daylight again. You just can't imagine seeing the outside of prison again. I've seen guys murdered in prison, and I thought I'll probably die in jail. And yet, you know what I said to myself? It's for a good cause. I'm a loyalist. That's the truth, you know. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 3, For gospel be hid is hid to those who are lost, because the God of this world has blinded their minds, lest they come into a knowledge of God. But it says in verse 6, But God commanded the light to shine. And that's the truth. The devil had me in blindness, and I couldn't see. I couldn't see the truth of it. I thought this is a good cause, you know, a cause worth dying for. And I remember that brought me down, as I told you, I had that visit with my mum. I was just glad to get back into my cell. And I thought, well, I'm here, you know, the next lot of years anyway. My mother was on the way home, and she called in to see my relatives. And as she was talking to them, my uncle and my aunt, there was, it would have been my uncle's mother-in-law, an old woman. And she, she was 80-odd years of age at that time, and she was sitting there. And my mother said, you know, David has went back to prison today. And she said, he's a hopeless case. Prison doesn't change him. She says, I have watched him over the years, and he just gets worse. When he comes back out of prison, he's back at it again, and then he's arrested again. And she just followed this sequence year after year. And she said, you know, prison will not change him. And she said, even if my David came home today, he'd still be a UDF man, because that's all he lives for, and he doesn't care about nothing else. She says, I don't know what will happen to him. All I know is he's a hopeless case. You know what this old lady said to her? Mrs. Hamilton, I don't believe there's anything as a hopeless case. She says, I believe God can change your son. And my mother went... <laughs> God, she said, there's more chance of the Pope becoming a punk rocker and my David becoming a Christian. And the old woman says, I am going to pray for your son every day that God will change his heart and he will come home from prison a new man. And my mother thought, little chance of that happening. And she shook her head like that, but the old lady shook her head and she put me on her wanted list. Guess whose fault it is I'm a Christian? I never wanted to be a Christian, you know. I went to church every Sunday as a child. It was terrible. You got your face washed with dolls and your hair combed, and away you went to church. And some weeks, right enough, it was funny. This lady played the piano. Well, she tried to play the piano. It was like Sesame Street. I mean, she was a Muppet. And I just thought, she is nuts, that woman. There were sparks coming out of the back of the piano and all. That's why there's always a glass of water to throw around the pianist. I know. And I hear I was sitting in church and then everything would go quiet and then this man jumped out from behind a curtain up the front. They called him the minister. For the first three weeks I thought it was Batman. <laughs> he had big long black robes and all on. And I was always looking for the Batmobile going across the car park. I'd shout, Batman, where's Robin? And he'd just wave. It was even worse than that. There's these guys stood at the door and said they were glad to see you when you were coming in. And then 15 minutes later, they came around with these bags, took your money, didn't even wear masks or nothing. They weren't even embarrassed about it. Batman never tried to stop them once. And they just come around and shake this under your nose. I hated those men. I used to see them coming and say, Ma, head your purse, they're coming, they're coming. And my ma, she just gave in. She surrendered. 
And then she gave me 50p, and he just put it in the bag. I just behave yourself. <laughs> I bought polo mints. And then when the bag came around, I put a polo mint in. If it was a good sermon, I put two in. You know, I was very spiritual, you know. But I used to sit there and look around me at all these Christians. Honestly, if you're over 60, you're allowed to go to sleep. But if you're younger, you must listen to Batman. And I would look around at them all. They're all dead happy, you know, and exciting. <laughs> They're all big faces like a horse. I mean it, you know. They were saying, Ah, oh, Mitch, A-P-P-Y. Ah, oh, Mitch, A-P-P-Y. I know I am, I think I am. Ah, oh, Mitch, A-P-P-Y. There was more life in a Duracell battery. Bet you didn't think I was a good singer, you know. <laughs> there are nightingales, and then there's gales in the night. But uh, back to my story. Honestly, I used to sit in church and thought, it must be terrible being a Christian. I mean, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't take the dope, they don't do robberies, they never steal cars. If you're married, you're not even allowed to look at other women. What do Christians do all day? <laughs> And I thought I would hate to be a Christian. You know, they come from another planet. But this old woman was praying for me. And you know what happened? I walked into my cell one night and there was a bit of paper lying on my bed. So I banged up the door and I walked over and I picked this up and I looked at it. And it said, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And then I said to my friend, to a cinema near you. And I was laughing. And I rolled it up on the ball and threw it out the window. And I sat down on the bed right and was drinking my tea. And it was only a couple of minutes later, as suddenly as that, this thought came into my mind to become a Christian. Oh, it was terrible. I burnt my lip on the tea. As <laughs> become a Christian? How long did this soup sandwich? I was laughing. I, mean, I don't want to be a Christian. So I went on drinking my tea. And this thought again was there in my head, become a Christian. And I thought, this is bad, you know. It's not even 8.30 at night and I'm having a nightmare about becoming a Christian. And then I thought to myself, I might be Irish, you know, but I'm not stupid. I thought, somebody's put dope on my tea. Because <laughs> sometimes they do that. If you're not watching, they drop tabs in your cup and then you drink the tea. and You're like a Muppet. And they're all laughing. And I said, somebody's put tabs in my tea. So I tossed it out the window, and I walked over to the bookshelf to set my cup up, and I set it beside the Bible. You see, there's a Bible in every bookshelf in prison. Everybody likes the Bible. If you have no cigarette papers, you just rip a page from the Bible. I smoked Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I was a real holy smoker, you know. You roll back cigarettes. Thank you, Jesus. You know what I mean? That size. I thought if you smoke the Bible, you'll never get cancer. You know what I mean? God doesn't want bad publicity. You know? What do you hear this? I, I lifted the Bible, right? And so I was looking at it. And I was trying to read it like this old English. It's amazing. That's my favorite version. But you see, at that time, I was looking at this. Whence comest thou? What's that? It's a piece of bow. You know what I mean? Everything's written backwards, you know? And I thought, this is terrible. You'd need another book to read this book. You understand this book. So I closed it and put it back up again. Walked back over to my bed. Got up again. Walked back over and picked up the Bible again. And was flicking through it again. And I thought, this is stupid. Put it back again. Walked back over to my bed. Walked, but you don't have far to go in your cell. <laughs> so I walked back over, picked up the Bible again. And my cellmate, he was going... I'm getting dizzy watching you with this Bible. I should tell you this first. Everyone in jail has a nickname. And my nickname is Packy because it'll go dark in the summer and they all say I look like a Pakistani. You know, but that's all right because Packy is Irish for Patrick. So everybody in Ireland thinks my proper name is Patrick. So I get called Packy. And my cellmate, he had a nickname too. His name was Bungalow. He had no upstairs, you see. <laughs> so that's why they call him Bungalow. So Bungalow was watching me, and he says, what are you up to? 
And I says, you'll not believe this. You know, I'm thinking about becoming a Christian. Oh, he went into a wrinkle. He was lying on top of his bed like a dead chicken. He had his legs up in the air. Holy, ah, ha, ha. Here is you, a Christian. You couldn't be a Christian. He says, go to sleep. You'll be okay tomorrow. You'll be normal again. And I was standing there holding this Bible. And then he said this to me. Anyway, even if you wanted to be a Christian, God would say no. He says, because you're one bad mom. And this is true, people. You see, when he said that, that pierced my heart, you know, like a knife. And you know what I said to myself? It's true, you know, God only loves good people. He'll have no time for scum like me. And that is a terrible feeling. Church, you need to hear this, you know. God loves sinners. God loves sinners. Because as I was sitting there, I thought to myself, this is stupid. Why am I thinking like this? I'm going to hell. God has no time for people like me. And I just closed that Bible and set it back up on the shelf again. Right? And sat down on my bed. But I tell you this, I was having a divine appointment with the Holy Ghost. And I didn't even know it. I tell you, you may think you've come here tonight under your own steam. But I know something else. We have a God, honestly, who works in you as wonders to perform. And God has a way of bringing things around that you come to hear the gospel. And you see, as I sat there on my bed, I thought to myself, God has no time for people like me. And as I walked over and sat down on my bed, you know what came into my mind? It was a strange thought. God has kept you alive. And I said, no, he hasn't. God has no time for people like me. And again, that thought was there. God has kept you alive. And I said, when? And as I sat there on my bed, I began to look back over my life. I believe it was divine revelation God gave me. Because people are not changed by information. You're changed by revelation. And as I sat there, the Spirit of God showed me numerous occasions where I should have died. And I believe some of you are here tonight and it's by divine intervention that you are alive because God in his mercy has kept you alive. It's only God's mercy in your life. And you know, as I said there, I started to look back over my life and I realized that night for the first time it was true. You know, I was just released from the police station and I'd been interrogated for three days by the police and then when I got released, I was selling breeding. And I went out for a meal with my wife to a Chinese restaurant. And as I was sitting there looking at the menu, the door opened and two gunmen came in. And they said, no one move. And they looked over and said, you're coming with us. And I knew them to be IRA men. And I thought they're going to take me away here to torture me for two weeks or so. And I thought I'd rather get a bullet in the head. And I thought, run for it. And I looked around and there was a fire exit door quite close to where I was sitting. And I jumped up and I ran for the door. And I was just going to bang it open and run through. And for some reason when I got to the door I stopped in front of the door, turned around and I ran up the room and went through the kitchen doors instead. And these guys fired shots at me. And they came running across the room and as I ran through the kitchen I climbed up onto a bin out in the yard and dived onto a wall. And the guy came running through and he fired shots at me again. And I dropped down into an entry and I ran up and lay on the railway tracks. And I remember to hear sirens and I was able to see the road and I seen the army and the police arriving. There was even a helicopter with a spotlight on lighting up the area. And I knew it was safe to go back into the restaurant. And I walked in the door and there was a policewoman holding my wife. She had heard the shooting outside and she wanted to go out the back. And the police wouldn't let her leave the building. And she thought I was lying dead. When I walked in the door, she came running over to me. And the policeman came over. And you know what he said to me? How did you know? And I says, know what? He says, how did you know not to go through that door? And I said, why? He said there was three gunmen. And one of them walked around the outside of the building and was standing outside the fire exit with a gun in his hand waiting for me to crash through the door. Who stopped me? I know who stopped me now. 
It was the Spirit of God turned me around and sent me the other direction. Another time I was in the building with the guy and we were planting a bomb and I said to him, leave, go you on out and I set the detonator myself. And once he left the building, I turned and set the detonator and as, as I was getting up to walk away, the bomb exploded. And sometimes bombs would go off prematurely. And so I just told him to leave. I was walking across the room and that's all I remember because the bomb went off. And I woke up lying on the ground outside and when I woke up, there was broken glass all around me. And I stood up and the building was ablaze. And glass was falling out of my hair. And when I looked at my jacket, it was cut to shreds. And I thought, I'd be cut to pieces too. And the amazing thing was, when I looked and unsipped my jacket and began to look, there wasn't even a scratch on me. And I thought, how come I'm still alive? Because I have buried guys who've blown themselves up like that. And this is true, people. There wasn't even a body in the coffin. We would put bricks in it to give it some weight just to carry it. And yet here I was, lying outside in this building ablaze, and I was still alive. And I thought, I am lucky. Do you see that night in jail? I said, that wasn't luck. When that bomb went off, God in his mercy put his hands over me and spurred my life. I believe that. Another time I was walking up the street and I heard footsteps and I turned and there was a man beside me and he pushed his hand up, he pushed a gun to my head and he said to me, you're dead. And as he pushed the gun to my head, I turned and I grabbed him and we started to wrestle and I was holding his wrist where he had the gun and I pulled it down and he shot me three times in quick succession. And when he shot me, I fell over and I was lying in front of him and he went like this to put the gun to my head and the gun jammed. And he turned and run. And they took me to hospital and took a few bullets out of me. And then people tell me there is no God. I know there's a God. Because God in his mercy spurred my life. But here's the thing. You see, when I was sitting in jail, I had a problem, you know, that night. Because I said, there's something not right here. If God only loves good people, then why am I still living? And I couldn't get past that, you know. And I thought, maybe God can change me after all. You see that night in jail, I wanted to change. I really wanted to change. And I thought, maybe, maybe God has spurred me and God can change me. I remember going to bed, right, thinking of it all this. And the next morning when I awoke, you know what the first thought was in my mind? Become a Christian. And I thought, maybe God can change me. And Bungalow was still sleeping. So I got out of my bed and knelt down, right? And I prayed about six times just to make sure God was listening. And I says, God, have you kept me alive? And then I want you to change me. But you must take away the hatred and the violence in me. And I was a violent person. I never went anywhere without a weapon. But I prayed that, and then I seen Bungalow starting to awaken. So I jumped up again. And he said to me, what are you smiling for? And I says, I, I have just become a Christian. Oh, he was really excited, you know. As soon as the cell door opened, he ran out the door. And I thought, oh, he's in a hurry to go to work. Not one bit. He runs out, Packy's a Christian. Packy's joined the God Squad. And I came walking out the door and all shouts, here comes Packy the Apostle. Oh, my face was beetroot red. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody says, tonight Packy will perform a miracle. He's going to walk across the bathwater. <laughs> Do you know what else I found out? You see, if you say you're a Christian, they all think you know the Bible. This guy comes up to me, are you a Christian? It's me, oh, I. Where did Cain get his wife? I said, Cain who? Oh, oh, oh. For the first year reading my Bible, anywhere I saw a pistol, I thought that was a wife of an apostle. You know what I mean? I had no clue. I tell you, I went to the prayer meeting, you know, the next day, and the chaplain says, it's good to see you, David, come in. He says, we're reading from Ephesians. I says, is that somewhere in Belfast? 
you know, and he opened my Bible for me. And I was sitting there when he was speaking away, and it was good, you know, I was enjoying it. And I thought, I'll have a wee smoke here. And I pulls out my tobacco tin, and I'm rolling a a cigarette, right? And I thought, why is he slowing down? (laughs) So I jigged up, and all I guess to look, and he's staring down at me. And I thought, ah, you're some Christian. You haven't even offered anybody else a smoke. You know what I mean? And I hear, you want to blow it? Oh, 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 shake of the head. Oh. And he says, David, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to have a wee smoke here. He says, you can't smoke here. This is a, a Bible study. Here's me, oh, I'm very sorry. I put that in a stuck on my ear and hid behind the Bible. You know? And you see, afterwards then, this guy said to me, if you really are a Christian, you should give up the cigarettes. And I says, I don't know. I've tried about six times, you know. And I says, I I find it hard. He says, listen, the Holy Spirit will help you. All you have to say is praise the Lord every time you feel like a smoke. I ran about the jail. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Praise the Lord. (laughs) They all said, that's a nut. That's a head kiss, that. You know. I says, it might be a nut, but I'm screwed to the right bolt. They're all shaking their head, you know. Then I went down to the canteen, you know.